are the Board of Public Works having our Wednesday, July 16th board meeting. And July 16th, 2014, Terry Colhane is the chair. He will be late, but we'll get started without him. Um, do we have enough of a quorum to, to do contracts? Yeah. Yes, you do. Or, then we have enough of a quorum to do contracts. As long as uh, we all agree. Yes, as long as we all agree, right. Uh, since there is no public, yes, I'm going to move past the public comment and discuss the minutes of the June 24th, 2014 BPW meeting. Um, did you get comments? From I did people? from David and Mr. Parsons. Okay, I read it, but I didn't have any comments. So, did you have some uh, some edits? Yes. More more in the line of questions, but yes. Okay. Yep. So, so I made I'll, some things up and put it in. Excellent. Then I'll second okay. your <coughs> All, all those uh, in, in agreement that we will um, pass the minutes as amended from June 24th? Aye. Aye. Okay, good. Um, we're going to save um, item number one, I'm sorry, um, until Terry gets here. So it's delaying your presentation. And we always like to reduce staff time as much as possible. But if you don't mind, we'll move on to contract for engineering services. And this is related to what? Uh, related to River Road retaining wall improvements to GZA Geo Environmental in the amount of $228,244. And it's coming from the Stormwater and Flood Control Enterprise Fund. And and I believe you sent us around the proposal, which maybe some of you had a chance to look at. So I move approval. Second. So first, uh, one of the first major capital projects that we'll be doing under the new stormwater and flood control utility, um, it is um, replacement of sections of the river of retaining wall that are failing. Um, and that is described in previous meetings. The fact that we've been successful in securing FEMA grant money to help pay for um, portions of the engineering and repair work on this. Um, staff had uh, issued a request for proposals for engineering firms to get um, proposals and pricing for the engineering work. We, we sent that out a little while ago um, and received three proposals, one from GZA, whose contract is in front of you at $228,000. $244. We had one from CDM Smith. Uh, their proposal price was $320,000. And we had a proposal from Tie and Bond at $185,898. What was uh, the last one? The Tie and Bond. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the amount? $185,898. So staff reviewed the, reviewed the quality of the proposals, the proposed project team. Um, the project understanding and approach and uh, came with a recommendation before you to hire GZA despite the fact that there were there were obviously more money than time bond um, but significantly less than CDM. Some of the reasons that we were recommending uh, that GZA get the work is they had uh, seemed to have a better understanding of the complexities of the permitting necessary um, to repair and replace the wall. Um, we had some questions about um, the level of effort that time bond had in their proposal for the permitting uh, that was necessary because of the complexity we felt like their proposal didn't have enough um, they didn't really have enough money in there we felt for some of the permitting that we uh, so we were hesitant on all those factors um, it was also time bond also had a significant approach to the project um, which involved using more of a performance based spec for um, for a sort of a vendor provided block wall. So rather than design the wall, it would be sort of a performance based spec for a company like Versalock or another company to come in and um, and provide the material necessary for the wall. So we were a little a little bit nervous about their approach. And we so we think that their approach in the, on on the design and the permitting wasn't quite the fit that we that we were looking for. GZA was was very deep in their understanding of the permitting um, in their design they were proposing to do the design of the wall. Um, and then the last thing, which really is not a factor that we weighed when we, we made the decision, but it's an important factor um, if the board moves to approve the GZA contract, is that 
We have uh, GZA is also doing the Roberts Meadow uh, Brook Erosion Project, which is also a FEMA grant project. And they're doing this project. The projects are very similar in nature and scope. So what we would look at doing is combining them into one construction contract, hopefully saving money on bidding and the cost of construction by having a larger project to bid at one time. So Ned and I had a kickoff meeting with FEMA for the folks from GZA a couple weeks ago and talked about the um, the process of combining them into one construction contract and the fact that we think that should result in some savings to the city in the end. So um, that was a few a few things. Um, overall, while I'm, well, I'm blabbing on about the proposals that we did receive, CDM we felt, I felt they may have had the best proposal, but there was so much more money than everybody else that we just felt like the other, you know, the other firms could do it and 320000 was really not where we wanted to be with the price on this. But they had a very good project understanding on the permitting, and they they had a team with with very deep qualifications, but unnecessarily expensive. Thank you. Can I ask a question, and then you, anybody else? Um, what's a performance base spec? So, it's a specification in this case where they wouldn't actually do the wall design. They would they would set the parameters for uh, for for what the wall would sort of the I guess the parameters like the height of the wall, the location of the wall, the purpose of the wall, some of the loading characteristics of the wall, probably descriptions of what the river conditions that um, the wall would need to um, would need to, uh, to protect against. And then the actual design that would be stamped by the company that would provide the product that the wall would be built out of. So it's sort of a manufactured wall that would be brought to the site and then constructed versus something like a cast in place concrete wall where the firm that you hire actually does the design and then you would specify in the contract documents how that wall was would, was to be built in place um, by the contractor. Um, so in the case of um, <coughs> GZA, they're going to still subcontract the wall, but it will be... They would design the wall and it, it would be built... They would design it. They would design the wall and it would be built to their specifications by the contractor. But it was it was included in their two hundred twenty eight thousand right. dollar bid as opposed to right. the performance piece. Right. David, you had a question. And the proposed wall would be precast concrete. That is what was proposed in the FEMA grant, and that is may that may be what we end up building. Um, the one thing that is a little more complicated about this is that I I met in May in front of the Northampton Historic Commission and they had some concerns about a cast in place wall replacing a pretty stone wall that's falling in the river and they, they're concerned about the aesthetics on that country road to make sure that it looks like something so to the extent that the wall extends up above the road they want that to look <coughs> like something so there's a demolition delay project on the wall until we come up with some pre-design options and I go back and meet with them to show them what the options are to make that wall look like something but um, the cast in place concrete wall has got some benefits in this area. Um, it sounds, you know, it's going to be a vertical wall. It's on a bend in the river, so when the river's really high, to me, you want something that's monolithic, something mm -hmm. that's going to be able to take the flow of the water, and you're not going to have a problem with water maybe getting behind the wall or causing potential failure of the wall. So if it's a monolithic wall, um, I think there's a good chance that I won't be working on this wall again before I retire, which is the way I would prefer to do it. Um, so the, the trick is above the road elevation, what's that really going to look like? Is it just going to look like a Jersey barrier all the way down River Road? Um, that's something that the Historic Commission wants to avoid. Mm -hmm. And Ned and I in our kickoff meeting had some discussion about, well, there's probably some things we can do to make that look a little nicer. Um, so we'll come up with some options and talk to the Historic Commission about it. David, do you have any questions? Yeah, I, is, this is this is a question. Is this a time and material pricing? It or is. Is it a fixed price? It's or or in between. It's not a lump sum. It's um, time and expense up to that. That's a not to exceed limit for the job. I see. So it's time and material, but not to exceed. Right. Right. Okay. Did you have your hand up too? MJ. Uh, I just wanted to observe, I, I actually work for Franklin County and I've been up in the Hilltown areas that have been impacted, that were pretty severely impacted by Irene, and they do have the precast walls up there, and while you can certainly see it, I mean, I think the our primary purpose needs to be the protection of the roadway, because, you know, 
those things can, you know, the, the extreme flood events lately have just been wear and tear on the retaining walls and all those smaller channels. Yeah, I mean, the power of water is just very intimidating. Yeah, I think people underestimate it until they see it really yeah. coming at them. Yeah. All right, a couple of thoughts. Um, one has to do with um, whether or not I have a conflict of interest to participate in this discussion. Um, although I'm not employed by Tyne Bond, um, my daughter is, and it's my understanding that if there's a discussion that um, might affect the financially mm -hmm. me or a member of my family, I can't participate. Um, I look at this as the staff bringing a recommendation to award to GZA, which is why I stayed in the room. And so, um, I hope that's right, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, and so then I, I went through the GZA proposal and trying to get a sense for whether I thought their pricing was appropriate for this type of project. And um, I think it is. I mean, it, it, I don't have a, a lot to go by, but nothing jumped out at me as being inappropriately high or inappropriately low. Um, we do have the issue of a resident engineer and the pricing of the resident engineer that we talked about a few meetings ago. They priced it at $75. Mm -hmm. um, so I think if we approve this, I'd like to make a similar amendment to what we did the last time, which was um, specifically point out that the price of the resident is $75 dollars an hour provided that the work takes place and I need to look at Jim in 2015 can this be constructed in 2015 yeah okay um, they're they're actually it's interesting because their their schedule shows are going into to 2016 but we had a, we had a discussion at the kickoff meeting about our desire to get it done sooner than that and we feel like it, it should be able to be done sooner than that. Right. And then we had some other words that, um, and that if there was a, a delay, we'd, we'd adjust the price unless it was the fault of the engineer. I think we used words like that the last time. I, I just think we had to do that to protect ourselves. But other than that, I think it's, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Are you talking about fiscal year or calendar year? Calendar. Yeah. My sense that those retaining walls need to be rebuilt reconstructed during low flow. Mm -hmm. Extreme low flow, which I think is July and August. Extreme low flow? Extreme. <laughs> Our whole right. concept of low flow is like uh, it's been pretty wet during the low flow. <laughs> so my, That's right. As I peek at Nicole, who constantly reminds me that we should only do things during low flow. Okay, any other questions on this contract? <coughs> All those in favor? Hi. Let me turn this over to you. Great, thanks. Uh, next, uh, for discussion, the Clement Street Bridge. Well, we want to go here. Yeah. We, have, uh, we didn't do the call Oh, good point. You were See? hoping the 30 minute item was <laughs> done with already <laughs> in 15 minutes. Oh, man. <laughs> All right. Sure. We'd like to hear from you, Nicole, about the um, approval of the forest stewardship plans. Sure. For the reservoir and the water supply property. Um, so, Mike Morris here. You folks, I believe, have met him um, when he did the forest stewardship plan for the water supply property surrounding the active reservoirs. So, um, we hired Mike back in uh, 2012 to do the same type of, of planning, forest stewardship plans for the water supply property surrounding the Roberts Meadow uh, reservoirs. So he, he began work in 2012 and completed the plans in 2013. Can, um, can, can, can you join us at the table? Oh, sure. Yeah, so it's just easier to hear no, you. No, yeah. You don't have to talk Nicole about Sanford, that. come on down. <laughs> yeah. There's a oh, small mic, too. Mike? And Mike? Yeah. He might be. So. <laughs> we won't make you vote on anything. No, I'll, I'll need to stand and point okay. to these oh, maps. Okay. So okay. I have to kiss <laughs> the Okay, I'm sorry. I just sorry. felt like you were talking at Mike's. I'm yeah. sorry. I, I could have stood up, too. Um, so, so we hired Mike in uh, the summer of 2012 to complete uh, forest stewardship plans for the water supply property around the Roberts Meadow water supply in Leeds. Um, and obviously Mike's here tonight and he'll talk about the contents of those plans um, and any recommendations moving forward. So 
we did apply for a grant for this work under um, the Massachusetts Forest Stewardship Program through the Department of Conservation and Recre Recreation. Um, the, the work uh, totaled $9,700 and the grant reimbursement that we received for these plans was uh, $5,710, so just over half of the cost of the project. So they're complete and um, Mike's here, so thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for being here, Steve. It's a pleasure to be back. As Nicole said, uh, I completed these plans about a year ago. Um, since then, a lot of things have happened. And it's been a busy year. Um, as I was going back, in, and we, we focused a lot up at uh, Ryan and Wes Waitley, um, so as I was coming back uh, to prepare for tonight, I was sort of reading this for the first time all over again. Um, I'm going to try and stand so that I don't block the, your view of these maps because we'll be referring to them. Um, what we're looking at is one parcel that's in West Hampton, we call Kingsley Farm, and then all the other parcel, parcels are in Northampton, all around Roberts Meadow, the upper reservoir, the middle and the lower reservoir. And um, this is Chesterfield Road, Reservoir Road, Kennedy Road, whoops, yeah, Kennedy Road, um, whoops, Kennedy Road and Sylvester Road. <laughs> um, Roberts Meadow Brook, Marble Brook. The, um, in West Hampton, that's 96 acres. In Northampton, it's about 440 acres of land. And then there's, I think it was about 40 acres of water. Um, altogether, the plans cover about 537 acres. Um, one interesting feature is that because of these major roads, there's almost six miles of road frontage uh, along this forest that um, is heavily traveled. So everything that does or doesn't happen here is part of the daily view of, of many people. Um, when you pull over anywhere to go into the forest, um, <coughs> Even if there's no one around when you arrive, before you know it, cars are buzzing by continuously. So a lot of people will be aware of, of anything that happens there or doesn't happen there. And we'll be talking a little bit about that later, when we, especially when we talk about the, the red pine. Um, just like for the other watersheds, um, the whole reason for doing this was to take stock of the forest, uh, the condition of the forest, and develop recommendations all pertaining to water quality. Even though this is not an active water supply, um, and so I keep getting the terminology confused, but it's a potential backup water supply? Emergency supply, I think that's Emergency, okay. In any case, we went into it with the same thinking that we used for the active supply, which is that everything that we would be doing and considering out there would be uh, pertaining to water quality first and foremost and then secondarily uh, we would look at habitat and also long-term revenue from timber. Um, the forest as you start walking through um, actually can I see does anyone go out here and spend any time out here? I did as a kid. Okay. <laughs> uh, from the beach or? From the beach and also the woods. Okay. Um, <clears throat> as you drive by, it seems like this uh, monolithic wall of forest. But when you, it, when you start poking around, there's some distinct differences. Some areas are dominated by oaks and other hardwoods. Some areas are dominated by white pine, um, including all along the reservoir road. Some areas are uh, plantations of red pine. <coughs> And um, there are some swamps as well. Um, so we, we broke the forest down into stands and there's 26 stands. These are these small units and within each unit you can kind of take a, a closer focus and um, evaluate what's there um, and make recommendations at that stand level. Um, of the 26 stands, 11 are red pine plantations. Some of them are quite small. They're they almost uh, hardly show up on the map, you know, as small as two acres. But these are areas where long ago, um, 
pretty much in the 1930s, um, proactively, our predecessors went out and planted these trees, thinking this would be the, a, a good thing to do for the water supply. Um, these large areas are, are oak and hardwoods, and um, it's, it's native forest. Um, was cut and cleared a long time ago and farmed and then abandoned and then grew back into forest and then around 1900 was more or less clear cut and um, at the time with the low deer population grew back into a fantastic forest of oak and other hardwoods. There's a little bit of hickory. Um, the, 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 there's some tremendous white pine. Um, most of these areas have been managed including in the 1980s there was a um, quite a bit of management taking place so um, in some areas there's been um, improvement to the timber some areas uh, haven't been managed enough um, this large area of white pine and, and this white pine here um, was planted and if you go in there today you'd see that it's very crowded it hasn't been thinned in a long time of the entire forest, about about half of the overstory is white pine, about a quarter is red oak, and then uh, about 20% is red pine, and then the rest is sugar maple, red maple, ash, black cherry, um, poplar, um, which in, is usually never very abundant, it's just mixed in. So we're basically looking at a white pine and red oak forest. Um, with red pine plantations, which are usually just single species, very discreet when you see them. And there is hemlock, but um, usually the hemlock is just in the understory and the midstory. There's not really, like at the other reservoirs, mature hemlock forests. Um, a few trees here and there, but not really stands of hemlock. Um, when we did uh, the planning for the other watersheds, we kind of defined what we would like to see the forest be like to provide the maximum protection for water, water quality, both now and going forward. And that was a forest that has the full range of native species, trees of a range of heights and, and diameters, um, lots of young trees that are free to grow. In other words, a very heterogeneous forest, but consisting of native species. Um, what we found out here is, no surprise, similar to what we found at the other watersheds. The forest is rather mature, um, which is good. There's a lot of big, mature trees, well established. What's lacking is much in the way of young forests, and that has to do with uh, the canopies being pretty tight together. Um, there hasn't been much in the way of recent cutting, and the deer population is pretty high. So a lot of what would have been growing has been browsed back. Um, there are seas of poison ivy and ferns in many places, but not a lot of young trees that would be uh, ready to grow in, in case there was some sort of storm, ice, wind, whatever, blowing down areas of large trees. Uh, there's not a lot in place that would just start immediately growing into those new openings. So um, all things being equal, what we would do is go out and start um, cutting in different areas, creating openings that can be um, filled in with new trees from natural seeding and from sprouts and kind of diversify the, the forest that way. Um, it's kind of the classic model of what you would do in a forest. However, there are some serious limitations that prevent us from just going out there and starting right away. Um, the main, uh, uh, I, I guess there's two, two main um, limitations we're facing. One is the non-native invasive plants that we talked about with the other watershed as well. Um, we talked a lot about oriental bittersweet and so I brought this. Um, this is freshly cut so there is a little bit of sap dripping but if you want to pass that around. Um, that yeah, I just went out this, yeah. on my way here. I stopped in here at the corner of um, Sylvester and, and Chesterfield Roads, and I just went with my handsaw. 
waded carefully through the poison ivy. So don't touch my shoes. Did you find any vines that big of poison ivy? You know, um, not quite that big, but definitely this big. That has rings that you can count. It's a woody vine. Um, I certainly can't do it without my reading glasses. But <laughs> a quick estimate is about 50 years. And um, I know we almost native. <laughs> <laughs> you know, More native than me, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> Over the course of time, I guess that will become native. Um, you know, even our forest, we think of, you know, uh, have it having been here a long time, but really it's only come back after the retreat of the last glacier. So, um, you know, it's not much more than 10,000 or 12,000 years old. So yeah, give it a few thousand years. Um, hopefully by then some of the pests that might attack that would become native as well. Uh, but right now it's pretty much, uh, there's almost nothing holding it back, um, shade holds it back a little bit, um, but it can even grow in the shade. Um, and the so threat that it provides, I mean, the, the threat that it causes to the trees is... Okay, the, the threat is that it, it climbs trees. Um, if they're not super tall, it can get all the way to the top and then just spread out in their canopy and basically takes strangle over it. that tree. It doesn't so much strangle it as suffocate it by, by shading out its ability to photosynthesize. Um, <coughs> Then once it's up there in a nice canopy position, it produces bushels of seeds. Uh -huh. The birds take them far and wide. And then wherever there's, and, and they, the, the birds kind of carpet bomb the forest. So um, wherever there's any favorable little micro site with sun shining and whatnot, those seeds will germinate and, and more bittersweet will start growing. Um, once that tree dies, it's eventually going to fall over. Um, possibly others will be doing the same thing. And then you'll get kind of a glade of vines. And if you're driving north on Route 91, we were talking about this earlier, you see full swaths of bittersweet just smothering everything. And then that is the new overstory. And instead of the tall canopy of diverse native trees um, with all kinds of other trees growing um, in the mix, you get the mat of vines, which could almost be a single species. Um, low diversity, low water quality protection value, uh, poor habitat value, and um, no monetary value. So it's kind of exactly what we don't want. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> sure. There are other non-native invasive plants as well, but the only one that we truly have a huge problem with right now is the bittersweet. Um, there's one called glossy buckthorn, which we really haven't seen yet, but if we do, that's also a problem. It's not a vine, but it is a tree that can grow pretty much side by side with others of its kind to a height of about 12 or 15 feet and basically shade out everything else. And then same thing, once, you know, the overstory trees, as wonderful as they are, they don't last forever. So you're always, as a forester, you're always thinking about what's going to come next, what's in place, what processes are operating here that will continue to give us a nice forest, come what may, and, 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 and bittersweet and glossy buckthorn especially interfere with that basic process that we just rely on and take for granted. Um, so when you look at this map here, uh, color-coded, uh, you don't have to see the stands, um, but just to get a sense, areas that were green had effectively no non-native invasive plants. Areas that were yellow had a small minor infestation that is possibly controllable if, if, if you're able to do that. Areas that are orange are in this transitional <coughs> stage where it even if you could control the invasives, and I'll talk about that in a minute, it would, it, would, it would be quite a task to do so because they're pretty widespread, pretty well established. So for example, when you're coming along Chesterfield Road into the areas of red pine plantations and white pine plantations, um, these areas are also loaded with oriental bittersweet. And then same all along uh, Chesterfield Road, I mean Reservoir Road. 
um, where you see the red and, and then the, the, the distinction here isn't, isn't very clear, but but red is red is very severe, <laughs> and and what that means is you may still have an overstory, but effectively it's only kind of a ghost overstory. It won't be replaced by more trees, or it means there's not even a functioning forest overstory. Um, the, this is just kind of a broad picture. If you go into, let's say, off of Kennedy Road, you go in here, you'll find some whole pockets that if we wanted to get more detailed with the map, we, we would color in red, where basically there are no trees growing and it's just vines. So that's naturally very discouraging. Um, the, uh, and, 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 and the reason that's a limitation to going in and doing any cutting to mix up the, the structure of the forest is all you would do by that is improve conditions for the bittersweet. Possibly some trees would benefit, but by and large it would be the bittersweet. You would be kind of just turning it loose. So that's why, just as with the other watersheds, we took an, a very conservative approach, being wherever we detected um, the invasive plants, we're not going to go forward and do any cutting. Um, and I did mention that uh, they can still grow in the shade, it's just that they don't grow as well. Uh, and I did mention that uh, the trees that are there shading them won't be there forever. So it does kind of create this going into the future of, of what's going to happen if that bittersweet is still there. And by the way, it's not just DPW's forest. This is this is the whole region. This is uh, this is a region-wide problem. Do you suspect the vines will inherit the earth? <laughs> <laughs> so far, I haven't seen that they can grow in the ocean. But <laughs> we we uh, I have a little house down in Puerto Rico and. You see it everywhere, and you wonder, do the trees stand a chance? Yeah, um, it is discouraging. Um, the, what, um, a couple of things seem to keep them in check. Um, it's interesting that these two areas here are not very infested, um, and it's uh, oak and hardwoods. These are the areas I mentioned that were clear-cut around 1900, which means they were already in forest. They'd been in forest for 130 or 140 years. And so there seems to be something about um, longevity. Um, it, it seems that the invasives have come in in the 20th century to this huge extent that we see today. Um, now, uh, that may not be the cause, however, because these areas, the reason that they were um, they grew back to forest so early is because the fertility is pretty pretty low. <laughs> so they were kind of abandoned early. Um, as a result, the, the oak timber isn't terribly high quality, but it's also um, tough for the bittersweet to grow there. So we might find that on the, on the difficult sites, maybe there won't be much in the way of invasives, but on sites with good fertility, they could be totally overtaken. I don't really have the long-term total answer to this. Um, the planning horizon is 10 years for these plans, and you want to come out at the end of 10 years definitely not having made things any worse, <laughs> hopefully having improved things. And with some other things that are going on in modern life, if you can buy time, then maybe a solution will arise at some point. <laughs> so there's kind of, kind of that holding out hope. Um, the other limitation that we would probably face, I say, um, and uh, I feel more certain about this than ever, is with the six miles of frontage and the incredible public scrutiny, any sort of cutting that we might engage in could cause quite a stir. And so that could be, um, uh, that could be a reason why we might feel less ambitious. Um, than more, otherwise. More, more of a stir than earlier this year? <laughs> <laughs> I don't honestly know because where, where the stir happened earlier this year, they're not really widely, tra heavily traveled roads, especially by Northampton residents, you know. Um, this is like part of the daily commute for, for a lot of people. So 
Um, and actually, uh, why don't I just jump to that? Because um, I've, I've been telling you about red pine. These these blue areas are red pine. Um, the, uh, let me just talk about the health of trees. White pine right now is quite healthy. The oaks are very healthy. Um, most of the hardwoods are healthy. With ash, we're looking at a pest coming into our area that probably is going to kill most of the ash, but ash is not a major component of our forest. Um, the red pine is in poor health. It's not native. It was planted. It seemed like a good idea at the time, um, but now, and if, if you've driven around here, you've probably seen that there's, you know, a lot of the red pines have brown tops. Some have died. Um, the decline that they're in is very similar to the other watersheds. It's been going on a long time. When you look at, um, you know, when you look at the rings that show how much the trees are growing, you see they've hardly been growing for at least 25 years. They're kind of, they're kind, they're kind of alive, <laughs> but um, they're definitely not vigorous. Um, there's patches of mortality in here that are kind of like a, a way to glimpse into the future. Um, and then Ned was telling me that he was over on this side of the stand looking back uh, recently and saw some of the mortality that's out there that you normally don't even see from the road. Um, so, uh, and I said at the beginning that we'll probably be taken to task for what we do or for what we don't do. Um, with red pine along the side of the road going to die can't really say exactly when, maybe within the next five years, maybe sooner, uh, maybe a little bit, little bit longer. Um, this puts us in the unfortunate situation of what are we going to do about it? Um, let it die and then try and clean up afterwards, which is certainly an expense and it, and it looks bad and it might look like we're not really taking care of the land. Um, or go in and preemptively cut, which um, all things being equal would make a lot of sense, but there's a lot of bittersweet in there. And so all we would end up doing is releasing the bittersweet and then we will have caused that. Um, there's beautiful sugar maple trees about this big around and six to 12 feet tall, all through this red pine. And so it would be wonderful to convert the red pine um, into a sugar maple stand. Um, it's, you can almost see how it could happen, but I don't know if we can get there because of the bittersweet. Um, that's something that we've been giving some thought to as to how, how to go about that. Um, the um, kind of the, the default answer in modern life is herbicide. That may not be the best thing to do here. It may not even be possible to do it here. Um, if you can't use herbicide, then what are the other options? Um, cutting, like that vine that I cut, actually won't kill the plant. Um, that plant will sprout back quite vigorously. Um, if you go back and cut it again um, and keep going back and keep cutting it within the same growing season, you might be able to sufficiently deplete the root system so that maybe it won't sprout back, but this is kind of an unknown. Uh, I guess it's pretty certain that if you cut it enough times, you would finally kill it. The question is, can you get there enough times to cut it? Um, so the, uh, if the bittersweet were absent, yes. clearly we would go in yes. and harvest the plantation of these red pines right. now before they die because right. they have some value right. and we could make good things happen yes. and achieve a little bit of revenue without it. If yes. we wait, the reliability for the city because they're going to die, they'll have no value and then we'll have to spend money to take them down. Right. So we're sort of caught in this issue with the bittersweet in terms of what, how best to manage it so that we don't end up with too much of a financial liability in needing to deal with these red pine stands. Yes. Have you have you used the um, 
had any luck using cultural practices and cutting and then actually going back and actually painting the stumps with uh, a solution of Roundup or any type of, uh, of woody uh, uh, ornamental herbicide? Well, not on DPW property, but a vine that size, yes. On, uh, for a different client, uh, I brought in a licensed um, pesticide applicator, and we cut those vines that size and put a, a garland solution right on the cut face, and it does kill the entire root system. And it is, it is nice um, if if you find yourself using herbicides, you want to use as little as possible, mm -hmm. use it as effectively as possible. And, you know, that vine came from a huge plant. Um, there's not even a way to do a foliar spray on a plant like that, but, you know, that tiny amount of herbicide is very effective. Um, and you still, uh, even if you, even if there was a green light to say, go kill vines like that, that's only part of the larger picture because all the ones that are still growing in that area are producing seed and so the area will reinfest. Um, so you, you it, it's kind of an ongoing situation that you have to stay on top of. It would be, you'd be in there constantly working yes. basically until mm -hmm. you're able to establish the, the uh, sugar maple stand. Yes, yes. It would be a long, long process. Right. And Bittersweet, starting from sea, can grow and climb a tree that is at least 60 feet tall. <laughs> so uh, the trees aren't really safe until they're very, very tall. So I'm curious, well, how big is that area, the blue block between the Kennedy Road and the bend where Reservoir Road comes into Chesterfield? Uh, this whole block here? Yeah. Um, the, uh, I've, I've got the number here. I think it's about 15 acres. 15. Yeah. Okay. And that's yeah. uh, that's kind of a wetland, isn't it? Well, it's it's odd. Um, it's a sandy, gravelly soil, but there's a low water table, or I should say, a high water table. And that's the so the upper Roberts Meadow uh, reservoir. Yes. Flows through that. Yes, it does. And this is Roberts Meadow Brook. Right. And the, what, what, what I kind of pointed out is the really acute area is between Chesterfield Road and Roberts Meadow Brook. That's so loaded with this stuff. That's yes. I, and also the red pine is in the worst condition. In well, the well zone. Yeah, the, the red pine is in terrible condition here as well. Yes. Um, if the red pines just die out there, I mean, as bad as that is, they're not falling on the road. Yeah. Um, there's power lines right hugging this road here. Yeah. Um, and it's just, you know, I, I worry that it's unsafe and unsightly and yeah. difficult to deal with. Um, and are the sugar maples between the roadway and the brook? Yes, they are. So how big is the acreage between the roadway and the brook? Or, or um, the approach there makes I know sense. I did an estimate on it. It's, it's, it can't be more than two acres. <coughs> um, in some areas, I hope I didn't just say this. It's only 30 feet wide. I mean, yeah. it's, it's right there. Yeah. Um, one of the utility poles is guy wired to a red pine <coughs> where it's only 30 feet wide. Okay. <laughs> just, um, and then, you know, uh, in, in this intersection here, um, it, there's a bunch of red pine that's dying with where, where that vine came from. So if we were to get in there and do anything, we kind of take care of this whole little corridor at the same time. So Mike has a question. So yes. maybe I'm jumping ahead, but it seems like if we don't do anything, the red pine die and fall down and the bitter street grows. And if we go in and harvest the red pine, the bitter street grows. So why don't we just go harvest the red pine? Um, that's a good question. I think um, I've come at all of this with the, kind of this core principle of not making the invasives any worse. So that's why I hadn't recommended something like that. But aren't we headed to the same end point? Yes. Regardless? Um, yes, it's uh, the way we get there is a little different. Um, yeah. It seems it would be a net lower cost to us if we harvested because we get some revenue uh, I see what you're saying yes um, I mean we do ha we do have to do a public education piece so that people understand why we've reached this decision mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. and maybe talk 
have, if I can interject, yeah. maybe also then try to get some of the um, the maple to grow. There's possibility, right? Yeah, well, minus the bittersweet, you would go in and carefully remove the red pine, and a lot of the sugar maple would survive that mm -hmm. harvesting process, and some wouldn't. But you would cut that flush with the ground, and it would re-sprout, and you, you know, you'd get a lot of sugar maple surviving. So it's it's right there in front of you. you could possibly make it happen, and it would be a lovely roadside stand to have sugar maple there. Um, but. I think within just a couple of years, all that sugar, sugar maple would be totally overrun with bittersweet, and then it, it won't even live for too many more years after that. And, and um, so, Mike Gary has a follow-up question. Well, yes, I might have one to follow his up. I did a project at Smith College where there was a lot of bittersweet, and we hired uh, New England Wildflower to come in, and our students worked in groups of about six for each one of the licensed. Uh, pesticide applicators and um, they did two acres in about a day and they were they weren't cutting stuff like that um, so it was pretty quick but it was two acres mm -hmm. and um, and they applied the stuff with the Nalgene bottles and the straw oh, okay. and just dripped it on there most of the stuff they were okay so, so they, they were, were cutting just doing stems. droplets and it was colored so you could really see yep. you know, it had a dye in it so you could see it um, other than the Japanese knotweed, it, it was pretty effective. The yeah. Japanese knotweed, they've, they've gone back three years now and, and done it, and, and it's finally getting there. But I was impressed. It does very little damage to everything else, and you're not spraying herbicide all over right. the place. Now, I'm sure a few drops hit the ground, but it's nothing like, um, you know, fogging an area with spray where everything dies. Right. Now, if we're talking poison ivy, <laughs> go just you know, dump the five gallon buckets on it. I'd be fine with that. But um, so I don't know I, I don't know why we a role in the ecosystem. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure it does. It have to take me out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it seems to me and I don't know what the income is from harvesting red pine and it can't be a huge amount of money and I don't know what we do with that money, but I doubt we rely on that money to pay salaries. So I would say we should invest in a project where we do very controlled uh, invasive species mitigation. Uh, it just makes sense, mm -hmm. and because that's the only way we're going to give the forest a, a chance to to um, to compete against that. And that would obviously take a pretty big um, public um, education process and and. Um, Maybe volunteers. I, I don't know if that's even possible, but uh, it's probably not possible. Public land and all that stuff. But I've been struck, Mike, as you've been doing this. That you, it feels like you've already tempered your recommendation yeah. based on the pushback from the the work out in West Hampton. And I I think we need better information than that. We can we can we can factor in the pushback on our own. We really need to know what you think. Okay. All right. Um, you, you're referring to last winter, that pushback? Yes. Okay. Um, For example, are that you... Pushback. <laughs> <laughs> that pushback. Or Waitley. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, all oh, right. West of here. Yes, that's fine. Right. So... Um, no, I've, 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 told, I've told you <laughs> pretty much what I think. Uh, so, Gary, earlier, I thought uh, um, I could see where you were going, and I, yeah. I don't think we ever got an answer. Um, a complete answer uh, on the issue. Suppose we took a smaller area. Exactly. Is it practical to, at least as an experimental uh, approach, see if we can, over the course of several years, tackle the, the bittersweet? By repeatedly cutting, you mean? Cutting, herbicide. I mean, how much of a head start do those sugar maples need? Is it a lost cause, or is it... Um. Let's just say, all things being equal, we could probably go out there and control the bittersweet now and the sugar maples would be fine. If we went out there and started cutting the bittersweet now, as long as we kept cutting it enough so that it didn't grow up on the sugar maples, we would probably be fine. Now the only thing is, once the red pine's gone, either from cutting or from just dying, um, the bittersweet will become very vigorous. So I don't know if we'll 
literally be able to cut it enough to keep it at bay. Um, we might have to try it as opposed to not trying it, um, but so I don't know the actual answer. So we have thought about this, probably not surprisingly. Uh, Mike and I and Nicole have met a few times about what to do with these red pines, and we don't have, we didn't have a recommendation for the board tonight, um, but you can see that we're looking for basic concurrence that the board supports the stewardship plans, but one of the key things and the highest priority things to fall out of the stewardship plans is what is our approach going to be with these red pines? And we'll talk, we, you know, we've been talking about many of the options and one of the things we've been talking about, you know, and, and of course the political environment that you mentioned, Terry, is, is sort of a, you know, it's a board issue and it's also a reality that we're, we have to be at least cognizant of as we, as we talk about these things. But we have talked about um, the option of trying a, uh, it would sort of be an experimental patch by trying mechanical controls, right? So mechanical controls, it's basically labor, money and labor to see if they can be cut repeatedly through a season, through a year or two years or three years to see Several how- Several growing seasons. To, yeah, to see how effective it is and the problem with that is, you know, no hauling is going to take these red pines to die. We could be cutting these for I don't know how many years. So there's a number of factors to um, to weigh. And the strip that we're talking about also is very close to uh, the stream that runs between the reservoirs. So it's a highly sensitive environmental area. Um, you know, we had we had talked about doing trials on bittersweet control in area using herbicide in areas totally outside of the watershed because we own property sure. that's not in the watershed, right? So you could do, you know, these are well, these are all just sort of talking points, so we have nothing we have nothing really prepared. What you could document application as Mike was suggesting with an herbicide on bittersweet in property not in the watershed to document the response and what that is and you could compare it to mechanical controls in another area you know, in the watershed in an environmentally sensitive area and trying to gather some data that might be useful in having a more intelligent conversation. There's been a lot in the paper recently about Fitzgerald Lake and their desire to use herbicides um, for a slightly different purpose, mm -hmm. but, um, and of course, the board members on the on the conference committee, you know, have heard Councilor Klein expressing an interest in setting up a, a committee within the community to talk about the use of herbicides and pesticides and how to get move in a direction away from that. So there's a lot of sort of complicating factors. Sure. Um, in the time frame that we're talking about, there are different time frames. Mike had indicated the stewardship plan, it's a 10 year time frame. We're trying to, you know, the sort of do no harm in 10 years kind of thing. It makes sense in some regard. I think Mike's question is a good one. If these trees are gonna die anyway, and we can cut them down now, and there's some benefit to do, doing that, I think that's a, you know, I think that's a pretty valid, uh, I think that's a pretty valid thing. Um, looking at the time frames and seeing what the outcomes are in the long run, Mike is focused on, well, once we get rid of the red pines, is it possible to make the sugar maple tr trees grow up into a, to anything viable there, or are we going to constantly, if by cutting the red pines, are we immediately moving into a situation that will be worse, which makes, you know, obviously makes him nervous that an action he takes will make a situation worse for the city. So it's really complicated, but it's great to hear the board's comments as we uh, um, we talk internally about the options, about what to do. But you can see it's one of the highest priorities coming out of the plan. I just want to say one more thing about the what you you keep referring to the the red pine problem or what to do with the red pine. It seems to me what we do with the red pine is directly related with that. So I almost think the red pine problem is is second that that comes first. You have to start controlling that so that the, the tree that's going to die and allow that to really take over, we can harvest that potentially within a couple of years or maybe we do it at the same time. I don't know. It would depend on a bunch of factors, but it seems like the bittersweet is, the, is sort of the first issue to solve um, because once you start um, shifting plant species around on your your property and you open up light, that's going to take over unless that's under control. Yes, exactly. And I think mm -hmm. if you look at the stewardship plans in the main watershed, one of the things that we're doing to control grapevines, we're taking action now to control grapevines before we're doing 
before we do any logging <coughs> in those areas because that's interfering vegetation that needs to be under control before you start disturbing the forest in another way. Yeah. So you're, you're right. I also have a feeling that people, are, I think people in, in general, the public is pretty well informed about bittersweet as being you know, a pretty uh, uh, voracious mm -hmm. um, invasive species. Hmm. Probably a lot of them who have an acre or more with woods know about that plant. <laughs> I would, I may be projecting here, but I, I think the board would be interested in a plan that includes some kind of uh, experimental approach, yeah. just as you're mm -hmm. finalizing your work. I, I, yeah. Maybe, I don't know what your plan is for the entire presentation, but maybe you weren't thinking bittersweet was the... No, no, core. no, we're, 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 we're close to the end. No, this is, because it is a, a key issue, um, and because in relation to all the uh, ownership objectives, protecting water quality, uh, keeping open the possibility of long-term timber revenue, and having diverse natural habitats, the bittersweet is, is counter to all of that. And, um, you know, we saw at, um, especially the Mountain Street Reservoir, it's such a huge problem that we only had about 4% of the acreage that we could actually comfortably go and work on <laughs> without making the bittersweet worse. Um, up at Ryan and West Waitley, about 75% of the acreage was pretty much good to go, so that's good. Um, this is sort of in between the two. Um, it's a lot closer to Mountain Street. So, uh, you know, maybe about 10% of the acreage. That's not entirely due to bittersweet, but um, steep terrain, wet terrain, stuff like that. But yeah, the, the, and, and it's only going to get worse. So if, if we can get into um, some uh, preemptive action, it will pay off in, in the long run. Oh, I was just going to say, I like, I like the way this is going, because I, I can hear what you guys are saying, and you're really worried about it, but I'm, I don't know, there's something about sitting on our hands that's just as bad, you know. And if, if we can find a, you know, conservative, I mean, a conservation corps or students or, or whatever to try and work on this, you know, and you never know when people might come in and say we have volunteers or... Adopt a forest. <laughs> people well, it's a tough problem. Uh, you know, to poison ivy. Um, yeah, right. As uh, with, you know, um, the stir last spring when, when we were logging, um, a lot of people came up to me um, and they said a lot of different things, and, and one thing stuck out and it kind of stands out is, but you're not going to spray herbicides everywhere. And I said, well, no, of course not. It would, in fact, the way things stand now, we're not doing any. And, and this this woman was, was very kind and well intentioned. Said, Maybe we can just get volunteers and pull <laughs> the bittersweet. <laughs> well, first of all, a lot of it can't be pulled, but yeah. second of all, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of it is is embedded in poison ivy mm -hmm. as well. They're just, you know, with deer ticks and all kinds of just pragmatic limitations. The volunteers, I don't think, will be able to help <coughs> us to a huge extent. And, you know, we might be helping the volunteers by giving them some practical experience, but it's probably not going to help turn the tide. Another question I have, and, and Jim, you... I don't know where this, how this dovetails, if, if at all at this stage, but um, Jim and Nicole and I have talked about whether uh, there's a recreational component that we're overlooking in the reservoir watersheds. Uh, you may remember we got grant money uh, last year that contained a clause that we had to look for recreational uses for the property that the grant was helping us to buy. Um, and Jim and Nicole, I think, both agree that probably the, the low-hanging fruit for this recreational component, if there is to be one, would be this, re this reservoir network. Is that, does that dovetail into this planning at all? Into the forest stewardship planning? Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, because when, when I mean, right now we have a policy that doesn't allow for recreation on water on water supply property. So Mike knew that going into doing these, uh, these we plans. We aspire to change that. And ju and just to 
clarify that the grant was for the purchase of those two parcels I understand. Um, and that was tied to those parcels so but we have met with um, Anne-Marie Mojo am I saying that right? the recreation director Wayne Fyden and Sarah LaValle and started initial conversations with with those folks and there is an interest I think um, particularly middle Roberts Reservoir to possibly open that up for um, canoeing but other than that, um, you know, I don't, the discussions haven't gotten much farther in terms of there is a large trail network. There's a trail that comes off of Roberts Hill. Right. <coughs> mm -hmm. And so if we're making a 10 year plan, right. it seems like that's a component that needs to be It could it be considered. I, I think it, it could, you know, we can, we can modify the plan at any point officially if we want to do that. At this point, um, some of the recommendations in the plan, we're not proposing to do much of anything. Mm -hmm. So even with a change in objective, okay. just I didn't want to miss an opportunity and say a year from now, like, oh man, we should have thought about that. Yeah, no, yeah. And we've, we've talked about it. Yep. No, as you said, the plans can be amended, and uh, there is no uh, indication of recreational use going into the whole planning process. But you know right off the bat when you say recreation, you know, you could consider a, a loop trail. Um, of course, there's some unwanted recreation, there's ATV trails, mm -hmm. um, but. The main interest was uh, the use of the uh, Middle Roberts Reservoir um, for canoeing and kayaking. And we also talked about trying to get, a, if there was a way to get a trail around the reservoir, that would be really nice. Um, those are some of the things that. But that doesn't have a forest stewardship component. Uh, well, you'd it, have it to certainly build, could. Yeah, because you'd you have to build, build it out of red pine. Yeah. We do all that boardwalk. We'll add that tomorrow. <laughs> but but it's a good no, it's a good point because it's a different objective, right? I mean, talk about that. Well, I'm pretty much uh, done. Um, you know, there. Uh, other than focusing on the red pine and, and the bittersweet, uh, the other things that came up are standard um, locating and marking the boundaries so they're clearly marked um, a little bit of uh, silvicultural work in other words harvesting in, in these stands where we can get access and some of it would create um, uh, a small area of early successional habitat and we might come in kind of through the, the stump and old log area we can work that out because there's a nice road going in um, but it's a fairly minor amount of cutting um, and removing a small percentage of the value uh, because mostly what's already in place, we need it to stay in place so that it continues to be pretty shady, at least for the time being. Um, the arts of... And, and Terry, just, just I, I, in answer to your question, just so you know, all the recommendations that I made um, in this plan were prior to the logging that we were doing last winter. Okay. So, but even even if I was doing the plan now, I wouldn't recommend doing anything less than I would have otherwise recommended. It's just that what we learned from the winter is that outreach is very helpful and it takes many forms. And some of them were quite unanticipated. But um, yeah, there's no, uh, I, I see no benefit in pulling back from what Good. made sense and still makes sense now. Um, and it actually, in, in, a, in, in encountering a lot of people in the, in the outreach phase, I think we've won some new friends more than anything. I think everyone was very impressed by the work that you and Nicole have done. And once they had a chance to see it, it was like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> I think that was the general reaction across the whole spectrum of people. Well, I think doing something on the side of that road would be just doing that. Just yeah. take up some bittersweet and don't do anything else for two years and, and let people know what we're doing and why. I think that would be great because I think everyone can see it. Yeah. That would be the whole point. And whatever we do, uh, we will certainly have to support it with a lot of outreach. Yeah. Um, you know, we did many tours of the harvesting that was going on and, and uh, you know, when, when you're in this and you're thinking about it, you, you don't realize how many 
assumptions you make about what other people know. <laughs> and so we had all kinds of questions like, oh, was this really farmed? Like they couldn't believe that there were farms there. They didn't know how, you know, the forest wasn't even that old and, and things like that. And then when you explain it, like, aha, it makes sense. They just had no way of knowing it. And, and but, but we assume that people know a lot that they just don't know. So I think, I think the consensus is that the board would be interested in seeing some thought put into ex experimental plans for how we might deal with bittersweet, how we might, you know, target plots where we think about the red pine. Sure. Is that mm -hmm. fair to say? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm very happy to work with Jim and Nicole and <coughs> all that stuff. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did we, did we do a formal vote for the approval of the plans last time? Or, or no? Was it just information? I don't think we have a plan yet, do we? I don't no. recall if we took a vote. Okay, I was just curious. The plan essentially is a policy in terms of how we manage the forests. So we don't want you to vote or wait for a future meeting to review the actual documents that were sent around and take a vote. Because it sets the direction for the activities that we... Of course, every contract that comes up subsequently it's based on the stewardship plans, so you get the opportunity to review those. But the plans themselves are really establishing the policy for how we manage the land. So I don't yeah, know whether you feel about. We got those a couple of days ago, right? It was 12 yeah, just got Those are just excerpts. Those are just the overviews. Yeah. And you just got them on Monday. Oh, that's okay. the plan. We have the actual plans. Exactly. Summary. These, these plans have been uh, submitted to DCR and approved, okay. which is what we did last time as well. Um, yeah, some we, reason, I think <coughs> the plans themselves are so thick because they have a lot of inventory information. Right. Mm -hmm. But the, the summary describes the goals as Mike had presented them to you and what the actions would be. So, so the feedback as far as dealing with bittersweet or the red pine doesn't need to be folded into our stewardship plan? Um, well, I'll just say that in, in addition to these plans, we've been developing a conceptual policy of, of dealing with interfering vegetation in general, which includes bittersweet. It includes grapes. Um, and we, but Nicole is the lead person on that. We, We've gotten it to a certain point, and we're about to do more work on it. I would imagine that we would be back here to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, but, but, but those that, that doesn't have to be part of the forest stewardship okay. plan. That mm -hmm. would be something that would come out of it that we would then come to the board with about that policy or whatever it is that we want to call it. So given that DCR has accepted this and approved it, mm -hmm. it'd be helpful if we give it a vote of our confidence? Sure. Is that what you're... When the board's... It would be. Maybe the next meeting? Yeah, sure. Okay. Is, is there anything we talked about tonight have to change those plans that were distributed to us? No. Okay. No. We should well, the, next meeting. the only thing would be, uh, I mean, it, the mention of recreational usage. If that's something that we should consider and put in the plan, then that, that's not in here at all because yeah. it, that wasn't. Um, Either it's in or it's out, I think. I think it should be in. I mean, this is... This, would DCR, would that do anything with the DCR approval if we threw something in? No, no, no. Well, we could amend the plan because the objectives would change. The objectives are water quality, um, you know, secondarily timber revenue and... Habitat diversity. And habitat, right, diversity. So recreational uses of the land would be a different goal than the ones that are identified in there. So if we wanted to add that, we would add it, amend the plan, and resubmit it to them. But it, it might be smart to um, think about the recreational usage kind of as a separate, um, like a report that maybe could be added on to the plan as an amendment. Because, um, I mean, wouldn't there be more discussion about recreation than? tonight. Oh, sure. Well, yeah. there's, also there's probably a lot. limited to very specific parcels and not just the yeah. whole, you know, we're opening yeah. up the, all of our forest yeah. to recreation. It would need to be a lot more discussion because we would need to have discussions with DEP about what those proposed recreational uses were and how they would 
define them and how they would be monitored and, and managed. Yeah. So nothing about this report would stymie those discussions? No. This covers three specific areas, health of the forest, long-term right. viability of the forest, because and those water are the, quality. Those, right, and those are defined by DPW. Okay. Other owners doing these plans might have other objectives or different prioritization, but that was the, the clear objectives that we went into these plans with. Okay. And recreation was pretty much considered not allowed. So the plans don't contemplate recreation at all, other than as a nuisance. <laughs> well, as I say, we, we aspire to improve upon that. <laughs> That's fine with me. Um, I just, I'll rely on Nicole to... As we all do. Yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you, Mike. Okay, thank it you all. Have a wonderful you. evening. I'll leave the beer seat here for you. Yeah. And wrap it up. Maybe with some salt and pepper. <laughs> 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 and then you die. You die. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to get it. 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 I'm not going to get yeah. 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 You watch for a bleach bath. Oh, I'm sorry. Because I browned so much. That's why. I know. I know. Which is worse, right? There's a really nice mechanical pencil. Yeah, there is. Well, the falling down happens really fast. He's taking it. You realize you got it. What happens when you dump the drawer out? Yeah, I know. 16 days after a bike crash. Don't feel so bad. Yeah. Mostly okay. Okay, so. Clement Street Bridge, yeah. is that next up? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm in the process of setting up a meeting with MassDOT on, on the bridge itself as to how we can move forward with rehabilitation of it, what that would entail. Originally, the mayor expressed an interest in being at that meeting when I met with him on Tuesday. He's going to be out of town next week, so yes, that we move forward without him on that. So I'll contact Rich Massey tomorrow at MassDOT, try to set up that meeting. He did express an interest that we update the engineering report that was done back, I think, in 2008 from Green and Pedersen as um, basically the options that we have out there on the bridge and what it might take financially to do the rehabilitation as a concept level like we did uh, first. So since the report is about seven or eight years old at this point, we wanted to take some of that first $50,000 from capital improvements and get an update on that. That was his, his express on that. The, mayor. The, the mayor, state one. mayor, yeah. Are we looking at replacement options or just rehabilitation options? Um, if we look at, from my understanding, talking with Rich Massey about two weeks ago, um, if we were to put it in as a rehabilitation, one of the first orders of business would be look at uh, the cost analysis of it and whether or not it would make sense to replace the bridge also, because they're looking for a 70-year bridge going forward, whatever comes out of this. Uh, you know, one of the concerns with Clement Street Bridge is that we all know that it's a five to ten year cycle bridge, you're constantly going to be doing work on it, versus a brand new bridge, you probably be doing little maintenance in the very first 10, 15, 20 years of the bridge life cycle. So that's something I look forward to talking to Rich about and coming back with a more definitive uh, path of how this works. Uh, he did tell me that there is no money available for probably at least seven years or so for new bridge construction. <clears throat> the accelerated bridge program in the state has taken up all the money into 2016-2017, and after that, they look at priority bridges going forward. Uh, where Clement Street is going to fall into as a priority bridge, I don't know. But this way, I get all the information right from uh, the person who really spearheads all these projects and starts them and knows uh, the ins and outs of how MassDOT works with bridges. That way, we have all the information. And I've talked to the mayor about it, and um, we agree that a, a reasonable course forward would be to find out what the state can do how, and, and what ways they might be willing to participate. Uh, we need the engineering study to give us some sense of what's the 30-year, 50-year cost of that bridge to the city. 
we need so in other words will the state participate in keeping that running keeping that going what's the cost going to be if we have to do it ourselves and then move towards some kind of a meeting with the neighborhood to kind of lay it all out and so the city there, there's if we wind up committing the city to doing most of the funding I mean that's a political decision it's not a so uh, my hope is to make sure that whatever we put out for uh, an RFP, there's, we get answers to the sorts of questions that we will need at, at this hypothetical public meeting. Okay, next uh, set of date for street acceptance hearing for Scanlon <clears throat> This came up, um, we had a homeowner come in, or a potential homeowner come in about a month ago, and she showed us some property plans that were drawn by her surveyor that showed her house in our way out of Scanlon Avenue. So we were looking at ways to um, accommodate that and get her to purchase the house still and so on. And we found out that Scanlon Avenue was never accepted as a public way. So Scanlon Avenue, those who don't know, it goes from Florence Road down into uh, Bliss Street neighborhood. It's a one-way street. We have a sewer interceptor line that takes in the whole Ryan Road area that goes through that street and a water line, um, some drain features. It's paved, it's maintained by us. So I asked the residents of the area to put together a petition to go to city council. They did that. It's come back to us now. And so we are ready to take it to the next level. We could do it before one of these <coughs> afternoon meetings. At one meeting, August 20th? Yeah. Okay. There's a small amount of butters to be notified. There's only four homes on the street. So it won't take a huge mailing list to get that to them. But um, if we were to do it for the August meeting, that'd be, that'd be fine. Okay. Are you having another meeting in July? No, this is the only one this in this month. This is the only one in July? Yes. Okay. And August 20th? 20th. That's what I have. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. 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 Really? Summertime. Nice. Oh, so you that. want to hold that at five o'clock? Five. We're it, oh, it's, it's it's so it's not far away. Yeah, that's. I think that's fine. None none of those meetings seem to last more than fifteen or twenty minutes. Okay, five o'clock. Um, <coughs> this isn't totally on point, but you may have noticed down below there's a thing about private ways. It's just a short update. I was on the phone with the mayor and Alan Seawald today, <clears throat> and we haven't gotten much back from the city solicitor about the legal side of the whole private, private way acceptance process. And um, he is now focused like a laser on that. He's all about private ways. And he thinks we'll get it back in a batch um, in September, maybe October. <laughs> he talked to the grad students. Certainly <laughs> before the snow flies. <laughs> okay. So an update on that, I believe the surveyor has four streets left to do out of all the private ways. He mentioned that there are a few that he hasn't There's received. There's a few. Of course. Yeah. I've got 30 of them, but I'm missing two. <laughs> I wish I could <laughs> start this project. <laughs> okay. So, so the surveyors. Surveyor's been great to work with. Yeah, so yeah. I'm with those last four will be. They're in the coming. works, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, next, for your consideration, a contract for resident services for the Eastern Ave Drainage Improvements Project to Robert Melstrom in the amount of $16,150. And of course, that's a stormwater and flood control Move expense. Okay. It's a contract with Bob Nelson to do inspection service services for us on the Eastern Avenue drainage improvement project. Um, I think it was at the last board meeting, the board approved a contractor with Rainmaker and Sons to do the construction work on that. It's about 500 linear feet of 24 inch drain pipe and associated work in Eastern Ave and along the flood control dike in that area. So. Okay. Um, 
Bob Melstrom is the same guy who did the um, oversight at the pump station, right, Bradford Street? Mm -hmm. Would he also be a candidate to do uh, some of that for the the uh, wall under the road? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so we have in front of us a contract for resident services. All in favor of approving the contract? Aye. 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 Next, we have a request for permission to occupy Pulaski Park on Saturday, July 26th from 11 until 3 in the afternoon for a show circus for the skate shop. A show circus, 2 for a skate shop demo. Where they sell two seashells. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> two four could read six. Two four. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, all right. Uh, and this is uh, July 27th. Uh, so on the following day, Sunday, he'd like to also do it from 12 to 3 for the yo yo demo by the Northampton bid. So we have police uh, department concurrence, uh, certificate of insurance. Uh, we do have the fees paid for it. I sent, I scanned you a copy, didn't I? Mm -hmm. yes. Are you yes. Yes. Without yes. my incorrect English. So it looks like the <laughs> fees are over the uh, Academy Music uh, Statement of Concurrence also. All in favor of approving these two uses of the park? Aye. Aye. Great. Can I ask a question? Sure. It seems like we routinely get this and we routinely talk about it for about 30 seconds and then we approve it. Might this be a candidate for something that we just stand up as administrative responsibility for the department as long as it meets all the criteria that we've already established? I actually the like the yo yo part. <laughs> <laughs> this way you cool. know about it. Mike. I know you about go it. To it. That's right. And, and uh, interestingly, I, uh, I had a meeting with the mayor, oh man, a few, uh, maybe uh, three weeks ago. And we talked about street, per street musician, the art vendors, this stuff. And he's not against some kind of a centralized committee with the police and the parking commission and the DPW. Right. They would just manage that. Uh, now, what, you know exactly who's got the political interest, the spearhead of that. I don't know, but that would be great to somehow consolidate that. I think the police have more to do, do with it than we do. Someone downtown. Someone downtown. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> You didn't hear we're going to build your new building right there. Right? <laughs> <coughs> but you, you want, do you want to put that on the agenda I'm for just a suggest It just feels like that there's times that there's things on the agenda that seem really pro forma that, you know, yeah. we go, we, you know, yes, they check all the boxes and we just vote yes. And this seems like one of them. That's what I was thinking as I was reading through the program. Yes, I like the, the to know about them. But I think that we can just to be notified that the department yeah. has approved this and okay. I'd be happy with that. Yep. Uh, so maybe we could make that an agenda item to discuss. Just, just that take, that will take longer than <laughs> approving them. <laughs> you might be right about that. No, I just raised the issue. Sorry. Well, would you like that to? I mean, we could certainly. Doesn't seem like a bad yeah, idea. It just might be make sense for us to take a look at a couple of the routine things that always come up. But you know. And when and we know that when there's a question that it comes to us anyway. Mm -hmm. Time is very valuable. Mm. Um, okay. Uh, I lost, lost my place. A uh, contract for 200, uh, 2014 phase one and then follow up dam safety inspections to G GZA Geo Environmental in the amount of $29,100. I assume that's for Upper Roberts? Uh, this is for all, all the city owned dams okay. that we're responsible for. So and if we um, paid for through the water enterprise fund. So this this provides us with phase one dam safety inspections for Ryan, Mountain Street, West Waitley, Upper Roberts, Middle Roberts, and Lower Roberts um, to keep us in compliance with Office of Dam Safety requirements. Um, for all the dams except for Upper Roberts, we're on a two-year inspection schedule. Um, high hazard dams need to be inspected every couple of years, so we're done in 2012. So we're ready for those. 
Upper Roberts has to be inspected every six months. So this proposal includes inspecting that uh, structure every six months for us. Any questions? All in favor of approving this contract for dam safety inspections? Aye. Aye. Uh, okay, next, uh, some late arrivals. Uh, a one-year extension. They're asking for a one-year extension to contract 297-13 for polymer for the wastewater treatment plant to Atlantic Coast Polymers. We'd like to ex mm. extend it to May 10th, 2015, I suppose. They all have the option yes. to extend. Okay. And, those. and the amount of the the cost of the extension will be sixteen thousand one hundred dollars. So there's been no change in the contract price for this. There's no increases in it. It stays at the dollar sixty one per pound. Okay, and that's to May tenth, two thousand fifteen. Two thousand fifteen. Oh yes. Okay. Any questions about the polymer? All in favor of approving the contract to buy polymer for another year from. Atlantic Coast. Aye. Aye. Uh, another extension, one year extension to contract 10 14 for sodium hydroxide to SLEC chemical. And we'd like to extend that contract to July 8, 2015, in the amount of 23000 Move approval. Second. Uh, this one year increase has got a CPI adjustment to it, just so you're aware of that. So I imagine it's going to be between 2 and 3, 3.5%, somewhere but in that range. They didn't ask us for that, did they? They have not asked for it yet. That's correct. It's their option to do so. Okay. So does that mean that this will go up by it may go up. Five hundred dollars or so? Um it's, it was Seven. a twenty three thousand dollar contract. Right, so one percent would be two thirty thirty dollars. Yeah, five hundred dollars. Yeah, so five hundred dollars. That's the worst thing that would happen. Okay. Five and sodium hydroxide is uh what does that do? Sodium hydroxide, if I recall correctly, is part of odor control. Okay. Great. All in favor of odor control? Aye. Uh, All in favor of odor control. <laughs> <laughs> it's like apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> Next, uh, for your consideration, a one year extension to contract 11 14 for a sodium hydrochloride, also the slack Hydro. chemical, also through July 8, 2015. And in an amount not to exceed twenty-four thousand nine ninety-nine. Move approval. Second. This also has the same CPI increase at the request of the company. So far, they haven't asked for it, but they may. And I assume that twenty-four thousand nine nine nine. That was not to exceed for both years. So. It's but we could exceed it if they want the CPI. No, not with the price they gave us. It was. Oh, uh, we just wouldn't buy as much. Right. All right. All in favor of extending the contract for sodium hypochlorite. Aye. 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 Great. Uh, next, a change order number three: the contract 258-13 for professional land surveying services uh, tied to the private ways. This is a time extension through June 30th of next year. Second. It's a time extension only to ensure that we have time to get all the work done. All in favor of extending that contract? Aye. 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 Uh, old business, stormwater and flood control. I imagine we're going to talk about it. We're, we're spending money hand over fist as uh, you approve contracts tonight. <laughs> the work we're doing. We figured that maybe it would make sense if we could get some bills out too so we can get the revenue side moving. Um, we are working. Uh, Pretty diligently with CDN to get the final billing database from them. Um, we did get um, what we considered to be the final database from them earlier this week. Um, right now, what we're trying to do is massage the format of it so we can put sort of a subset of the entire database on uh, online so that people can check to see what their bills are. So we're working on that. We're hoping to have that posted either by Friday or at the beginning of next week. So our process from, from that point within DPW is to take the database that we get from CDM and then go through um, the slow process of taking 
to the bill for every parcel and then entering it from the database into Munis. And that's sort of our customer by customer check for what the database is. So you can imagine the database itself is like 10,000 parcels. So in CDM database, we were looking for very, we were looking to review, stop. <laughs> looking to review what their pro, let me stop. I want to get every word, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's one thing. In conclusion, <laughs> <laughs> like I was saying, BJ's the best. Um, so as we were working with CDM on the database, we were looking to make sure that um, all the elements of the data analysis was, was correct. And, and you're looking on more of a, in some ways it's a more global scale and you can pick things and, and make sure that they get fixed. And now the last, so there's been a lot of quality review on the billing, basically is what I'm saying. But up to this point, we haven't checked every single parcel. And now as we enter the data from the CDM database into Munis, we will be checking every single bill to make sure that they're, that they're right, basically. So, so you and Doug will be there with your slide rules going through each calculation. Yeah, I'm hoping to train some of the younger engineers in the slide rule thing, but uh, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Okay. So that's what we're doing on our side. Um, there are some other logistical matters that the city is working on in terms of uh, getting the bills out, but um, we need to, re we need one of the things Anne Marie is working on is we need to change the, form the format of the water sewer bill. So if you look at your water sewer bill, we need to add lines for the stormwater fee. And if you get a credit, we want it to be able to indicate on the bill form that the credit is, is so you can see what it is if you're getting on some basic things that are requiring a little bit of work. But, so the first bills will be going out uh, for that utility in October and it'll be two quarters of bills in the first, first ones to go out. Um, so that side of it's going well. The project side um, is going pretty well. You can see we've had some contracts in front of you. Um, I'm still working on RFPs for the flood control pump station, which I know that you wanted to see. I didn't have it gone anywhere with that in, without forgetting about you. And the, the levy um, certification work, we're also working on an, on an RFP for that. So trying to get everything up in, in order. And um, how about uh, Church Street and uh, King Street Brook? Does that come up elsewhere? Yeah, yes. it's under informational at the bottom there. So oh, gotcha. Okay. We'll cover that. Then never mind. We'll get there. So um, I think the storm water flood control things are coming along pretty well. And we are getting people walking in, asking questions, and calling. We've had most of the questions we can answer here, mm -hmm. so we haven't had too much trouble. A few we've had to refer to you guys. But once it gets up on the website, that will save you guys some time. That'll be fine. Yeah, I'm sure people would like to check. Yeah, right. we've had you know people asking, and um, you know we've been we've, we've been preparing some information. We've put a lot of information about the credit policy online. We've been directing up and getting some calls. We've been directing people to the website, so that information is there. That trifold uh, frequently asked questions thing that we used as a general mailer before. Um, Doug and I updated that recently, and we have it just as a two-page thing, both sides on the counter. We have copies at City Hall, so if people want basic information about the utility. We changed it to indicate, you know, where we are, the right. ordinance was passed and, and that sort of thing. And we provided that to the clerk so they have a basic understanding of we what have, the utility is. Yeah, and we have a whole setup out there only with stormwater, mm -hmm. everything. And we had someone pick up a credit policy. They wanted a hard copy. Thing, so. So, it's trickling in. Yeah, I think it's I think it's going. Yeah. It's okay. going well. Yeah. And once it's online we should have talked to Chad about maybe a little article in the paper. Yeah, I think it would be good. He, he said he was going to run an article on the credit policy. He told me this a, a while ago, and I think it would be good if we could do an update on, you know, the billing and the credit yeah. policy and that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, reuse Center mission statement. So we sent out uh, the uh, memo to everyone. Did anybody have any comments on the mission statement? So pretty much it. David just gave me some comment. He says, oh, we don't have anything about events. So we'll bring that up to the group on our next meeting. Right, and I also suggested a little more emphasis on the success thus far of volunteers in, in running all the events. Mm -hmm. so. so 
So we're good to go on that. Yeah. The second issue is Paul Spector came and uh, I think he uh, has, they decided not to go through with the, um, uh, the bad, the styrofoam container issue, but they're working toward making some changes for next Earth Day 2015. And so that will include plastic bags throughout the city. Um, I have my notes here. But he said something about Northampton is like, do you remember what he said? Uh, like one of the best communities in the... Sustainability. In the, we have the five summer. We were the mm -hmm. first. Yeah, yeah, but this is much more detailed <coughs> than that in terms of plastic bags and stuff like that. But I don't have it in front of me. But, um, but so the issue for the board to consider is whether people on the reuse committee can write letters to the editor. That's considered, that could be considered lobbying or it may not be under the auspices of what the board would like to see the subcommittee do. So I'm just bringing it. I don't know if we need to get um, a legal opinion on this or. Um, uh, Are you looking? for um, a, a vote or a uh, well, I guess my first question is, is it a legal issue? Can the, a board subcommittee make some, do some, in the name of the committee, in the name of the reuse committee, write letters to the editor, for instance? Can they do it? And then would the board, if, they, if we think that they can, would the board support that? Care. Jump in anywhere. Yeah, really. We know they can. We know they Should can. they? Well, I just want to make sure that it's legally because when I work for nonprofits, you could not do lobby because it would violate the 501c3 charter of the nonprofits. So, so where is the line between lobbying and advocacy and education? I think that's yes. the question. That's a perfect Or someone's to put it. personal opinion. Yes. Well, well, personal opinion, they would just do it under their own name. But right. They would do it as a member of the reuse committee. Okay. And it's clear that the reuse committee is a subcommittee of this board? Yes. Even though it has people that aren't board members? I mean, David and I are on that are committee on with to represent the board in the same way that we do transportation committee, the, the joint commission. The yeah, but those aren't subcommittees of this board. They're standing committees that are separate. So I, that's... Oh, uh, tree or, yeah, you, that's an interesting that's point. That's an interesting point. Yeah, tree committee is a separate committee. Um, or the other separate Mm -hmm. mm. Traffic. And those members well, are also, also all ordinance driven too. We had yeah. private ways with the subcommittee until we've gotten into that. But that was yeah, just our ourselves. It was, it was within right. ourselves. Right. And so that was clear to me. I, I just didn't realize this right. was considered a subcommittee. So, so that's, but in any event, that's the crux of the question you're bringing to the board is, is, is that or is that one of several? issues, questions that they have. There, uh, that was the second issue. The, 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 the mission statement, as, a, as endorsed by the board, was the first one. The second one was um, writing letters to the editor. And the third one was uh, one on whether or not you, one could use a reuse facility at the Glendale Road um, uh, facility without stickers or with or stickers would be required. Let's go back to the, this the letters. I, I, I'd like to find a way to encourage them to do that because someone needs to try to get information out to the public. So I think there's, yeah. there's, a, there's a favorable okay. element of this. I just don't know if, if that committee writing is speaking for this board or not. That's really the question. Are we yes. worried about them speaking for us, or are they just speaking well, for they themselves? Could, if they speak committee. for themselves, is that do we do we want to look at a letter before we before they send it in? I guess that would be the way. But we have two members, right, on the committee that should okay. look at it. Well, and we would. Yeah. I trust you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so you're not talking about. Um, 
a member of that board writing a letter to the editor and, and signing it as a, as a member of that committee. Yes, that is exactly As opposed what to about. the committee coming to a consensus and sending in a group letter. There's, as a, both of those are possibilities as opposed to the third one, which is just uh, Rochemere writing a letter saying, oh, I think this is a good idea. No mention of BPW affiliation, no mention of reuse committee. That's always possible. Yeah. Um, so, I guess my first question is, is it, is it legal? I mean, is it okay? Is it? Do we need? I, I can't imagine. I, think it's, I can't it's imagine it's illegal. illegal. I, it, um, but the ACLU would crucify us if we tried to. Yeah. Well, I don't even think we'd want to. I mean, so, I, I, I think if it comes from the committee, it needs to be a committee work product and identified as such. Okay. And as long as the committee members, it's the consensus of the committee members, I, I think that's fine. Okay. And if any one member of a committee, the committee is writing because they feel compelled to do so, yeah. that they might identify themselves as a member of the committee, but make it clear that they're not speaking for the committee as a whole. Right. Right. That's two different things. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yep. And they both work. Right? And they both work. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Or they could just write as a citizen and not identify themselves as a member of the committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's it wouldn't have any they, 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 they ought to identify themselves and explain it's not. I think it would have more weight if they did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. and usually the Gazette figures that stuff out sure. anyway. Sure. We'll put it in italics underneath. Right. Yeah. Be known that you're yes. a member. Yeah. Uh, Sending this cover yeah. letter. <laughs> or a member at least. <laughs> so then the final issue is just the transfer station stickers. People right now can use. Locust Street here with the transfer station sticker. But, um, and, and they can use Glendale. And they can use Glendale. But if, do we want, does the board want to allow non transfer sticker participants at Glendale Road reuse center? Mm -hmm. Is that feasible? As or once they're on the facility? It would take the gatekeepers to watch everyone a lot closer to make sure that <coughs> that's all that they were doing was visiting the reuse center. Mm -hmm. yeah, you have to have a sticker to get in, don't you? Well, there's nobody checking you at the gate. You're in when you get checked. You're already there. And you might even be already doing your business, whatever that might be, chucking stuff in the whatever. So when you work at Glendale Road, you actually pull into the gatekeeper's hut per se mm -hmm. and they acknowledge that you have a sticker and what you're here for and bulky item costs, some money transfers, things like that. And a sticker is required. A sticker is required. Which is the way I think that it should continue and for, for one thing I mm -hmm. think the public should see it as a single operation, a single gatekeeper and everybody should be treated the same. In, in the long run um, we could continue to think about it, but I think for the moment we should stick with the stick with the stickers. So, we we've operated these single day recycling reuse events that are open to the whole community, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so I understand the logistics Staffed of what you're saying. Staffed by volunteers. No, I, I get it. Oh, but I mean that's a part of it. So is there we're kind of going the wrong direction by reducing the number right. of people that can use the facility, and, and I understand the complications, right. but it... Um, is it... Is there any practical way to let the general public take advantage of the reuse center? I mean, if they just say, I'm going to the reuse center, we might get a little bit of extra recycling out of it, you know, but... Do all our volunteers have stickers? Good point. I don't think so. Oh, I mean, you. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I actually, I agree with you. I think we'd like to encourage yeah. people to use it. I, I'm worried about the them generating enough volume mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. reward all of their hard work. So, so we don't. You can't dispose of trash at all at 
Glendale Road anymore, right? That's correct. No. So the only thing you can do there is recycling stuff. And brush. Brush. And big bulky items. And bulky items. Bulky, 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 yes. bulky, bulky items you have to pay as right. you go, right? Large metal yes. containers, freon devices get taken there. But as a, at, on, a, on a fee basis, right? That's correct. So rigid everything plastic. that's there is fee, unless it's just metal. Or rigid plastic. Rigid plastic? Bulky yeah. rigid plastic. There's no fee there. Okay. And what about bottles and cans and that? So yeah. it's really specialized in terms of recycling. Right. If, if somebody so why would we care if anyone had a sticker? Yeah. Because we're making money on that other stuff, aren't we? are not we? making money. You're not? We <laughs> never make money. Okay, okay. That's, a, that's the fallacy about recycling. I know. I know. <coughs> you're right. You're right. We're not. Sorry. But it's not. So we'd be making. Not, we'd be losing less money. <laughs> we'd be losing. <laughs> we're, we're trying to <laughs> stem the outflow. That's so all. We're get up on volume. <laughs> if somebody yeah. comes into Glendale with tires and a stove and pays those fees, do they are they also recorded on the sticker? Yes. 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 Today. Yes. yes. Right. They Maybe are. Everyone is right. So there's yes. a consistency. This yep. is just another function, the way tires and appliances are, are a function. But I think that this is an unintended consequence of co-locating. Right. If it had been over here at the Mass Highway right. site, anybody <laughs> probably mm -hmm. could go there. But I do think we should open it up to other to members of other communities. In other words, anybody could buy a sticker. To go to the reuse center or to use our facilities? Well, to use, use this one as well as bring in their stoves and refrigerators. So what you're saying is selling it just so it would be like you're a Northampton resident, but you're not, and you can buy a sticker to dispose of your waste at Northampton recycling facilities, whether it's recycling it's like stuff. choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So then we'd have to look at the bag fees again and the cost of the sticker no, the again, bag, the whole thing. The bag fees wouldn't change. Well, I no, but I'm, we, we know we're, we're not making money. We know we're losing money. And the question is, are we going to lose more money by having more participants or lose less money? There's a perception issue that because we've structured the fee system so we don't break even, yeah. and we're living off of excess revenue from previous years, right. if we allowed outsiders in, no. we're subsidizing out of town. Yeah, I, I just don't think that's right. Yeah, this could be viewed as sort of an add-on service, like the food waste composting. It'd be great to have a sticker. I could do that food waste composting up at Locust Street. Yeah, and maybe other people will think. Great to have a sticker, and then I could use that reuse center down there, and they couldn't use it if I didn't have one. And maybe that would help with some of our revenue loss on the sticker side. Well, that is exactly what we're talking about, right? So, would it help? What do we think? I don't know. Or you think it's a, you would think uh, politically it would, would be the wrong message. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, you know, it, we're, we're stuck with this because, as you said, we co located. Yeah. And doesn't the taxpayer base pay our salaries? That's uh, that. I thought we were trying to make the, the recycling centers, uh, what would you call them? Open and Self-sustaining. Self-sustaining, yes. So, so it, it, and I don't it sounds like yes, they can write letters, and <laughs> at, for the moment, people need to then we have a we have a we have the determination. But you can hear that there's some. You know, but they can write a letter <laughs> about <laughs> the <laughs> sticker problem. <laughs> yeah, but and I think we're conflicted because it seems yeah. to have. Yeah. Uh, it's know, not really what our. Our intention was. Right, no, our intention was no. to encourage as much use of the reuse center, but by the, right. the fluke of co locating. Ideally, you'd want everything open to everybody. But, yeah. You know, how do you make it fair and how yeah. do you make it add up? Yeah. Well, it hasn't come up. It actually came up between Dave and I. It hasn't really come up from the, from the group. No, I, I purposely haven't mentioned it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so, you've now shared it with the world. What? I said you've now shared it with the yeah, world. Yeah, right. Right. But I think it's important to have a. Um, Can we say something? Oh, come up on the first day it's open. Yeah, exactly. And what, what are the instructions to the right. gate attendants? Yes, exactly. So we can we can always check, go back. Is it feasible? Do you think that if someone 
indicates to the gate attendant that they're going to the reuse center that they could just pass in? The only you can do that if you have designated parking for the reuse center and you make sure they park there and they walk to the reuse center and don't go around I mean, back. and they just let go. I mean, let it go. Yeah, maybe they're going to sneak some uh, plastic bottles in the thing, but I don't think that's going to turn out to be a big mm -hmm. problem. It could be done, I think. We'd have to look at some of that. Could you actually, we said, look at changing some of the traffic flow patterns up there so they'd be in a separate area down towards the reuse center, which is down at the very end of the building, versus all the waste disposal is in the middle or the other part of the, the campus up there, the parking lot? And could we at least survey the gatekeepers who work up at the site and ask them their opinion before we make a final decision on that? Mm -hmm. It's a great idea. And I, I mean, I'm already feeling like we should at least have it be open for discussion. We should make a decision tonight, is sort of mm -hmm. my feeling, and because it's like we don't want to reduce the amount of use at the reuse center, but we're not making a decision the other direction either. Mm -hmm. right. So. Yeah, and I don't think the gatekeeper should have to police whether someone is sneaking a some plastic bottles in the they oh, police the now. That's their job. But but the control point is at the front gate. At the front gate, not the back of the disposal. Right. The they're disposal. still they're still uh, collecting money, right? They have to bulk the items. Right, That's so correct. Tires and mattresses, mm -hmm. what television sets? Yep. Television sets, beyond yep. containing devices, okay. furniture, furniture, bulk the items. So they could be pretty busy. I'm just saying upon traffic. Well, whenever I've gone there, it's been pretty quiet. Well, what the time do you go there? <laughs> um, 3.15 on one <laughs> Oh, we're close. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> All right, so we'll keep talking about this. Yeah, apparently. yeah. Open the discussion. Uh, crosswalk policy. <coughs> um, Are we waiting for the April 4th meeting? Well, uh, I, had, I was on a conference call with the mayor and Alan Seawalt today. Oh. And they feel um, prior to the April 4th, the August 4th meeting, um, it'd be helpful to do a couple of things. The woman who came to us looking to paint the veterans crosswalk they feel should be treated as Melinda Shaw was treated. Our lack of format for Melinda should become the lack of format for this next proposal. But we should declare, officially declare that there is now a moratorium. We are not accepting, we're not entertaining more requests at this point. Mm -hmm. okay. we, had not, we had not previously stated that. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's wise. Um, so they they both encouraged us to let the veterans sail through. Um, we probably have a better handle at this point on the costs involved, having been through one. Yeah, this one will be a little bit different simply because the crosswalk length and number of stripes may vary, right. but we'll have a better, we know more about the paint and the application mm -hmm. and how much we need and all that, so. Mm -hmm. And the colors. And the colors, yeah. <coughs> now, um, it's, it's a complicated issue, and in, in, in the end, we may decide to just put the cap back on this bottle and, mm -hmm. and not do it. Um, but at least they're hoping we could come up with a formal declaration that have, henceforward, until we have a policy, we're not accepting new applications. Do you need a motion to that? Yes. But, but we will accept the veterans? Yes. Because they came in prior to any... And that's a part of the motion. I would make it as two separate motions. Yeah. A motion moving okay. forward that we won't accept any more uh, considerations or requests for sidewalk crosswalk. Until we've worked out the policy. Until we've worked out the policy. Second. So that's a policy that, or motion I just made. Second. Does that include that? Pardon me? Um, just the same provisions, exactly the same, same as, as what we did. Okay. Right? Well, so the, same, the same lack of process, basically. Right. Uh, I mean, the uh, lack of process. EJ was, was asking about money which was 
long-term. This is a moratorium. This is the moratorium. Oh, this is the moratorium. Oh, I need to just this. Yeah. This is the moratorium. I did second. All right. All right. Good. I like that. Okay. So, so the, this is the uh, the motion is to request a moratorium moving forward. That until we have a policy in place, we will not entertain any more um, requests for um, paintings of crosswalks. Decorating is the crosswalk. Okay, and we have a second. Yes. Uh, discussion on that motion, Gary. Do you suppose we could um, set a timeline on when we would have a policy? I mean, are we just setting a moratorium and until we have a policy could be six months, a year, two years, never? Do you have a, a suggestion? Well, I, um, I remember it seems like more than a year ago, I think it was probably two years ago, and I think it was, I, I, I tie it in with the woman who came and had the uh, temporary photographs that she was doing on sidewalks. Somebody had a proposal that I think we actually got off the website, somebody's website, about doing artwork in crosswalks. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was the old fashion where you had two bars traffic going this way, and you just sort of filled everything in. And now we've adopted a, a different standard where there's no crossbars, mm -hmm. there's the white ones, but why couldn't we have anyone do it? So I thought that was a great idea. I think it actually improves visual safety because it's, it adds color. So with a standard crosswalk, you have, let's call it black and white. It's pretty basic. It's just a simple graphic. But when you add color, it changes things. Now, as long as the simple graphic remains, you still have the white bars, then you just have a different kind of contrast. I think it's a <coughs> good idea, and I would want to, I'd hate to see that not happen. Yeah, and I think we were looking at the, they've done it up in Turner Falls, and it worked quite effectively. Yeah. And there, are, we've, you know, we've seen it. We, you know, uh, the crosswalks that Smith had for about ten years uh, had green and red colored stuff with two white bars. I, I prefer the bars going this way myself. I just think they, they show up better. It seems to me that in developing this policy, we're going to need input from other entities in the city. Right. And so coming up with a schedule might be a bit of a challenge because we don't. It's going to be hard to predict how fast they'll respond to right. our request. So I, I guess I'd be reluctant to commit to a schedule. This but maybe we could commit to our part, at least our, you know, that we would have, we would, we would um, come up with a policy that we could share with the rest of whoever the. So we could draft a policy. Yeah. We're going to exactly. need some of the spearhead of subcommittee. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I think it has to do with transportation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think, didn't, didn't we get I don't have to use crosswalks. This, this <laughs> applicant car. send a um, proposal, <coughs> a, uh, a policy, a draft policy? Did she? she I did. believe she did. Yeah. And you were going to say something about the thing that, I think you brought this art thing up from somewhere else. Like it's an ordinance that got passed actually in late 2013 where whether this was going to be considered public art or not if it did so and it was going to last more than 90 days i had to go through the arts council the question is is painting a crosswalk public art well th this is all to be ironed out in the policy <laughs> it's fertile ground i mean it's a definition of art oh, this will be interesting. So the question before us is, there's a motion to declare a moratorium on new applicants for crosswalk decoration. That's been seconded. How do you feel about your, your offering a potential amendment? Actually, I wasn't thinking of it as an amendment. I just wanted to bring it up. Okay. That's just part of the I just, discussion. I, I, I'm fine with the moratorium. I think it's a good idea until we really, so yeah. that people know when they come here, they're going to get some kind of answer based on right. something and they can uh, plan their presentation accordingly. But I'd hate to just take it. Well, maybe back. the Crosswalk Subcommittee could get back to us with uh, <laughs> a perspective timeline. That would, that's not what we're voting on right now, though, is it? <laughs> 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 All right. So, I any further discussion about the moratorium? No. All in favor of instituting a moratorium on uh, crosswalk decoration? 
Aye. 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 Until such time as we have developed a policy. Good, <laughs> uh, and then I don't think we need a vote for the second part. Uh, if Do we have paperwork from that woman? There is paperwork. Is it that Catherine Osborne? Yeah. It is. Um, and I believe BJ supported that to all of you as part of your I mean, she's yeah. been corresponding yeah. with yeah. me on yes. a regular yeah. basis. Yeah. So. so it seems to me we have to update our pricing information. Well, we'd need a layout. Yeah. Right. So what we did with Melinda is we came up with different scenarios for what the layout could look like. We did like five of them. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up reaching agreement with her in terms of what it was going to be. And then once we reached agreement, we did the right. research to paint. Richie helped us develop the, the pricing, and let her know how much it was, and that sort of thing. So we need to do something similar. And on this other one, you need a layout and the price. It would be nice to be a little more. So, so we haven't voted to approve this decoration yet, but clearly the mayor and the city solicitor are suggesting we we move in that direction. We probably need to put something in though to make to make it explicit that this is not an open-ended. They're not buying in perpetuity that crosswalk. Yeah. Um, should be until the next painting cycle or something. The same as the concept is the same as what we said for the. Yeah, we didn't say the, much. Yeah, but well, we, but they were just going to. We more than nodded, I bet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, but we did. We, but we're treating it the we, same I, way. It was not my impression that we had agreed to the paint the rainbow way. sidewalk. For the rest of time. That's right. No. We agreed to it's one one page cycle. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. And j just as an aside, is the uh, the white lab <coughs> ironclad? There's no give on that. Well, yeah, I mean, that could speak to it. It's you can do them. With, I think you can do white stripes on either side, but that was discussed at TPC, right? Right. So is Chief Sinkowitz is concerned about the enforceability of a crosswalk and making sure it met the MUTCD standard also, which meant that you had a white line that was X feet wide by whatever length it was going to be if you're doing the ladder, and then a space between that. And this is why we went for the alternate of white to a color, white to a color, so that we had that consistency of white there all the time. Uh, this one might be a little bit different. It might be red, white, blue, uh, and then another white. So it's going to have to be that alternating white again, I think. But you think it has to be that? I think it has to be. Why, why couldn't it be red, blue, I'm sorry, white, blue, white, red? That's what it white. Blue, it, as white, the mayor red. pointed out, the if you read the um, state guidelines, we're already running afoul. They, they said we can use other materials between the white stripes, but they suggest not using yellow or red. Suggest? Yes. But I mean, my point is we're already ignoring the guidelines. The other way you can do is you do the horizontal bars, which came up a few years ago, which meant changing the pattern and, and the consistency we have in our crosswalks across the city by doing a couple of them that could paint between the horizontal lines. But even Gary said, and one of the reasons we went to letters, the visibility of it. Right. Okay. All right, so that's kind of the sense that they're suggesting. and. Is the I don't think we need a vote on that second part, but does that seem reasonable that we're letting the veterans one move forward? I think we're letting the veterans ones move forward with uh, as long as they uh, coordinate with the department in terms of layout, um, mm -hmm. the finances, and all of that. So, yeah. but I'm saying I don't think we need a vote at this point. No, it's just right, we're general just, consensus. We're just yeah. staff can work this out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Church Street, State Street, flooding. Uh, Church Street and State Street, no flooding, which is been yeah, good lately. It's, it's been, it's been, been good lately. Um, I actually went down this morning. This morning, just to check it out, and it was yeah. nice yeah. and working fine. It was running pretty well. It sounds like everybody was out there. MJ called me first thing. And Richie uh, was out there first thing, and I went out this morning to take a look. Um, the channel is running pretty well. The culvert is fairly clean. The basic challenge that we have at the moment is that there was a lot of uh, silt and sediment built up in the channel behind these beaver deceivers and stuff through the years, and a lot of that, every time it rains now, it's getting flushed. 
down into the uh, in the vicinity of the inlet of the culvert. So that's becoming a maintenance headache. Um, we j we jet rotted the culvert out about a, I don't know, a few weeks ago and had it totally clean. And now we're getting these sandbars that are forming. Richie had his guys uh, July 9th use shovels and buckets to to clean out the sandbar. The July 9th, the last day of that. It was the last day of the, no, it was the month, the month it was uh, the 7th. So the, the last Monday. day of the emergency order, we did it by hand with shovels and buckets to get the sandbar out of there. And if you take a look now, every time it rains, and every few days we're getting another sandbar built up. On the south side? This is on the upstream side of the culvert. Yeah. Yeah. So the sand doesn't actually make it into the basin. It's, it's dropping out before. Um, for a, a number of reasons, so for now until September we can do we continue we continue to use labor, manual labor to get rid of the sandbars and then we can do that under the permits that we have now. And Nicole is telling me that after September we need to get more permits to continue to do that when we're out of the low flow period. So there's some permitting that she needs to help me with so that we can t continue to maintain. Um, removing the sand in front of the culvert because it's a kind of a key piece of keeping all the, the water in there. And this labor is built to stormwater? The labor is built to streets. streets. So the employees that do the work, the streets are in place. Right, but are we tracking the, isn't this a stormwater issue? It is a stormwater issue. But I thought that our stormwater funding was predominantly for capital improvements and not for maintenance. Am I wrong? Mm -hmm. No, there's, there's a generous there's, amount of... There's, uh, there's, there's staff. There. There's staff in there for yeah. too. This seems this clearly needs to be tracked and appropriately assigned. So I'd have to look at the people. Everyone's divided into different utility mm -hmm. funds mm -hmm. and look at the people Great, that yeah, are yeah, going out. And yeah, So some people, their hours people are divided, some of them are 50% streets or 50% stormwater, whatever, they're all divided. I have to go back and look at how we did that. So it's sort of, sort of built into the staff that get assigned. It's not that we have to track it different or anything, it's, it's sort of built into the budget that way based on who so does the, the work. So those employees have already, they've all, it's already been recalculated? Right. Okay. Right. But the important thing is too that we have two new positions in this utility that haven't been filled yet and once those people are available, then if they did this work, then it would be 100% from the stormwater utility. I mean, it hasn't been a ton of time. I mean, right. you know, well, it's been a fair amount of time cleaning out that basin. It took a lot of work to do that. We had all kinds of people down there doing stuff. That was last fiscal year. And that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Saved. Saved by the bell. So, sure. but, but, so if we, if we get two new employees, two new laborers, or equipment operators, I'm not sure what exact category they would be in, but and uh, suppose they're helping because of water main breaks. It'd be crazy for them to be sitting back at the station waiting for the bell to ring. Well, they wouldn't be helping on a water main break. Right. Even if you needed more hands on deck. No, they, they, they would be. Well, in a time of emergency, it's mix and match. It doesn't matter. It's like right. snow plowing. You gotta do what you gotta do. This project that we took on over here, because of the um, emergency mode that we're in, we basically used all the resources we possibly had. So, right. you know, I'm paid my bulk of my salary from the streets division, but I go down and I inspect the work every day. And I coordinate a lot of work with the streets employees to do the type of work, you know. So we haven't really vetted out the time as to who's doing what and when it's done. The other issue that operationally that we had is that the sewer division is falling so far behind with so many sinkholes, which you'd be right around town everywhere. So the sewer division employees used to perform the maintenance of the brook, whatever light maintenance that we did. So I've kind of taken them out of the equation and have used streets employees because we also have a lot of summer seasonal laborers. So if we have free time, I've been using their resources to do this work so the guys who actually can run heavy equipment, rebuild catch basins, repair sinkholes are actually doing that particular job. So it would be a little bit of an exercise to track the amount of time that general fund employees are working on this project and I think like I said it's been a mix and match but I've tried to keep the sewer division out of it only because of the multiple emergencies we have all over the place. Right. There was, I, I don't know if you were here but uh, Dick Kozowski is often 
here. Um, asked about uh, the practice of using water and sewer employees for snow plowing, and did we track that? And it would be very it would be very easy to actually track it. And Ned, Ned and I have talked about mm -hmm. next for next season we're going to track it for the entire season, and we can think about. I'm not against them working at it, but he raises a good question. We should have a... How does the water department access the utility during the winter for not plowing the street? To totally, <laughs> like, but we need a number. What are we talking about? Are we talking about $10,000 and like, who cares? Are we talking about $100,000? I mean, you know, what's the scale of this? We need to track it for a season. Mm -hmm. And so we can say, look, here's the, here's the, the amount of money involved. This is what we think is reasonable, and it, that sounds like an intelligent answer. Mm -hmm. All overtime is snow and ice. Right. Any right. overtime but, but is the snow and time, ice for every department. Regular but, time's not Yeah, time. regular time is not dark. Yeah. So this this is another, you know, another scenario. So it'd be nice in the, if we start moving toward a situation where we can can at least keep track of the scale of these things. So some other things in Church Street. We had an emergency permit from the Board of Health to do uh, trapping of beaver in the marsh. Uh, it was a 10-day permit. Um, we set traps and tracked them for 10 days and didn't trap anything. In the meantime, we're not seeing any signs of new activity that are clogging up things beyond the way that they're already clogged. So we didn't extend the permit to get another permit to do any more trapping. So we're going to stop that effort at this point. Um, we're doing. Uh, some study work. Nicole is helping me weave through a myriad of regulations to help me better understand ways that we can do things. Um, we've authorized a small study that CDM is doing in the hydraulics of that culvert, so looking at the drainage area, how much water from the Round Hill area is being discharged down the brook, is the 4x4 four four box culvert big enough for the amount of water we expect, what storm, if it's partially clogged, how much water can it pass, how clean do we have to keep it, how much water comes down that channel. I want to dredge that channel, but I need to know the dimensions of the channel, and in order to know that, I need to know how much water is coming down it. So we're trying to put some of these pieces together right now to figure out what um, what we're going to do with that channel itself. In the meantime, we're starting to look at the Barrett Street Marsh. Overall, we did some survey work on elevations of beaver dams, water surface elevations out there. Um, the 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 uh, inlets to the culverts that go under Barrett Street, um, the inlets in the basin and by the, on the bike path side. The water is just tremendously backed up back there. There's like, you know, through the whole area, there's a um, Carlin Drive, there's a big basin there that's filled with water. And it's just a big mess. Those beaver dams are huge and they're backing up a ton of water and we're trying to figure out what to do. Um, I'm looking at some of the old files. Back in the early 2000s, the city had a proposal that they had filed with the state to dredge a new channel through the Barrett Street Marsh. And that project obviously never happened, but clearly the thought at the time was that that needed to happen to keep the drainage flowing through the marsh. And now we just have a series of very large beaver ponds with a lot of water. Um, so we're trying to review all those things to figure out what we're going to do uh, moving forward. but. In the meantime, we're just really fixated on keeping the culvert clean and open, trying to keep the neighborhood happy with the things that we're doing. We're still looking at other um, things. Richie and I are looking at driveway improvements to a couple of the driveways to raise the aprons on State Street, which was a, the way a lot of the water was getting in. Um, engineering division worked out a section um, for us to use as a guide for construction. I think that's going to make that a little bit better for them. So a bunch of longer term things and still some short term things that we're working on. But, you know, I think when it rains like it did last night, you can lay in bed thinking that these people aren't being flooded, which is a pretty good thing. Um, and then we just, and every time it rains, he's out there, or I go out and take a look just to make sure that, you know, nothing is going wrong. Um, so we're going to send out another update, I think, this week. It's been, I think, three or four weeks since we sent one on the Any questions? I found some really interesting aerial photos of the, of the marsh. I had I met with um, Tom Jenkins from GZA, who used to work with Bay State, and he was working with the city in 2000 on designing that basin and 
his name is all over the files. I mean, this guy was done a, doing a ton of work for the city, and I met with him. But he, he, had, he had a series of old aerial images that he, he let me see. And it's really interesting to see what that marsh used to look like. I mean, everyone, I think a lot of people probably know, I know Jim Dostal knows what it was like, but um, back in the 70s and things, when it was an agricultural field, the aerial show, a very straight, well-maintained drainage channel through there, and you can follow over time to see things fall in a general state of disarray. But, you know, aerials, they're, they're fun to look at. Can that be used as a precedent for reopening the channel that was in the aerial? Yeah, that's the reason why I was looking to, to try to get the information. Yeah. No one will remember. And I'll tell you, if you go out in the marsh now, it's gorgeous. I mean, Richie, were out there one morning, and we're looking at ways to can we take these beaver dam down? And we were talking to Nicole about the permits necessary. And we were out there one morning, and it's like blue heron flies down. <laughs> you know, but what are you gonna, what are you gonna do? You know, it's everything's a struggle. Great, thank you, Jim. Gary, anything we didn't touch on? Probably. That you'd like to touch on? No. <laughs> Did all the c contracts, like the time extensions, get circulated? Time extensions don't need a contract. Uh, it's just a verbal okay. Gotcha. <coughs> Nothing else. Okay. Yeah. Almost out. Thank you. Yeah. No. Um, no. I have a new tooth. I will tell everybody. <laughs> I got a dental implant. I got my tooth today. Now, anyone has had this, it takes like six oh or eight months to get your teeth. God. I had this big oh. hole in my head. I'm like, I'm like, this big hole in my head for so many months. And now I have this tooth and I'm going to go home. And I'm going to eat like this huge salad tonight because I've only been able, able to chew on the side. Mm -hmm. And now I can chew on the side. <laughs> oh. Wow. Life is good. I mean, you admit it. Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm halfway through that process. It's, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, they drill in your head and all that and little ratchets and all that stuff. Yeah. It's good stuff. It's yeah. my first time doing nitrous oxide. Do you need to get a permit for that? that? I think there was a trench permit that took off. <laughs> Curb cut. That's why it took six months. Dig safe. Yeah. Dig Dig safe. Dig Dig safe. safe. <laughs> 250 bucks. Good. 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 Uh, City Council considered Pat Goggins who the mayor has recommended be our next member. Uh, City Council seemed generally favorable and they've referred it to the subcommittee on nominations or not sure okay. what. They have a committee for it. Yeah, it, it's, but that's the concept. They'll vet him, see if he seems like an outstanding guy. But presumably that'll go through. Excellent. Great. Move for adjourn. Okay, nice. Good. All in favor? Thank you all very much. And we're now meeting.